also we are in a season in the house, and we always use this word in TPH season, because we are an apostolic house. And I know that some of those words can sort of tip you off, but it's important to know what the Lord is doing per time. And that's just what an apostolic house means. It means that you're not following the news. You are the news. You are the one that brings what is happening in heaven on the earth and you become the news. That's just what it means. So at every time, you must know that you, you are privileged to be in this sort of house where God shares his mind with us. He says to Abraham, can I do anything without telling my friend? So God tells us things. So we are in a house that we get the prophetic word and the video on Friday, we announce the new dawn. We announce the new dawn. And today, really, the topic I've been given is preparing for the new. Preparing for the new. We have been talking about dominion. And really, what the Lord is saying, it's not different. It is just narrowing our focus. That there is a new that is coming. And what is the new? And how do we prepare in the new? That's what we are here to discuss this morning. And so my text is taken from Acts 16. Here, Acts 16, 9. It's talking about Paul. It says that an vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. For Paul, this was the new. He had gotten this vision in the night, say, and he saw a man. He said that the man is from Macedonia, a man of Macedonia. I said, come over and help us. So this is the new. And this is the second missionary journey of Paul. This is one of the first assignments in the second missionary journey. So we're going to backtrack a little. So how did Paul go about it and what brought him to this point where he understood what the Lord needed him to do? Because we are saying that we are in the new, but we, if we don't understand, then we are going to be laboring in the wrong direction. Hallelujah. So Paul got to this point where he understood. He got a vision. A man was saying, come over, come over, help us. So let's backtrack a bit. The, second, the first missionary journey ended with Paul and Barnabas going together. And the second missionary journey, before it started, Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways. And it was because of another apostle, John Mark. And so they separated. And we'll be looking at four things quickly. And one of the first things is that in this new, it means that the old will be shutting down. And that's the first thing we're looking at is that the old will be shutting down for us to go into the new. The old must shut down. That is it. You can't go to secondary school without shutting down primary school. It's not possible. You have, it has to shut down. And sometimes in the shutdown season, it's quite uncomfortable. This transition season is quite uncomfortable. I know there are a lot of theological reasons um, or explanation to Paul and Barnabas' separation. Some people think that it's a result of their flesh and their ego and all of that. And it's possible. I'm not here to, um, to elaborate on why they separated. But I know that in this season, one of the mark of a shutting down season is that there will be separation. And whether it's our flesh, and we're not saying that your flesh should reign, but we know that the Bible said that all things work together for the good of the believer. Whether it's a mistake but whether it is also God orchestrated, because we can see in the Bible that separation is a mark of growth. Joseph was separated forcefully from his brothers and from his family. And why you can say is because the brothers were carnal, and so they were threatened by Joseph. The truth is that Joseph wouldn't have been able to save Israel if he did not leave. So God would have made it happen somehow. Abraham was the best example because there was no disagreement, right? And this separation mustn't always happen with disagreement. Amen? In fact, when there is disagreement, the Bible says that you should pursue peace with all men. That means you should make sure. That's not the time to leave. So the right mark to leave is when the Spirit of the Lord says leave. And Abraham is the best example because he said to Abraham, get up, leave everything to a land that I will show you. So there was separation. Even Jesus was separated from his biological family. When his ministry started, he had to leave home. He had to leave his, his, his brothers. He had to leave his mother. He had to go. And there was no disagreement. But the thing is that with us, we love, we love the good old. We love the comfort of, 
of where we have known. We love the safety of what we have known. And so that's why in the Acts of the Apostles, for the apostles to take the message of God to all of the earth, they had to go through persecution. If not, they would have loved the company of the brethren. And the company of brethren is fantastic. But when it is time to move, it is time to move. So in this season of, of the old, we, we need to be sensitive for relationships that will close. And it will close. And it will not close because there is a disagreement. I keep saying because we have a way of justifying the things our flesh wants to do with the word of God. Am I speaking to Christians? All of us are guilty. You will use the word of God to justify your own decisions. That is not what this is about. This is about times and seasons. And when the old is, is over, God will shut down. And it will be good for us to obey God before he does it forcefully. Amen. The second thing earlier in, in, in Acts 16 that also happened that was very, was very enlightening to me as I considered the shutting of the old was that he went for Timothy. And that's because as the old relationship shut down, God in his mercy will bring new alliances. He went for Timothy, but he also circumcised Timothy. And this was after they have agreed that circumcision was not necessarily relevant because God had moved from circumcision of the body to circumcision of the mind and the circumcision of the heart. So the apostles had agreed and Paul was one of the champions saying to them that stop, stop religion, stop circumcising, it's not stop laying on them the burden that you cannot carry, speaking to the, about the Gentiles. But this was Paul because Timothy was half Gentile. He was not circumcised. Paul said you must be circumcised. And this is very critical. That we will know things to do. We would have revelation from God. We will have wisdom. But not every time we need to stand out. It is, it's tough to know the right way to do things. And for peace sake, allow the old way to continue. It is tough. Because our flesh wants to revel in the glory that... We have the revelation, we have wisdom, we have understanding, we know all things, we know the new. But it's okay. So Paul went and circumcised Timothy against even what he had argued with the apostle, just so that the word of God will, be, will not face any, tra any challenges when they go on the way. So that they will not have to unnecessary battles. So they will not have unnecessary battles. How many unnecessary battles have you entered? Because you want to prove that you are right. And it's true that you are right. It's a bitter lesson because as a parent, the truth is that your children come arguing. Oh, she beat me. Oh, she slapped me. Oh, it was the first that did this. All that they are arguing is so that you can take a side. You know. And many a times when we go to God complaining about one another, we want God to take our side. I'm, am I speaking to real Christians? Not the ones that <laughs> are prim and proper. Real Christians. We want God to take our sides. We want God to validate our actions. So the child is just waiting for you to say, hey, you, why did you do this first? Uh -huh, they are okay. They are not really there for anything. They just want that validation. But we need to win ourselves of the validation of others. We need to win ourselves because Paul would have gloried and he says, I could do mighty works with Timothy that was uncircumcised and God still showed up. So circumcision is really useless. But she said, no. Let me, let me conduct myself. He also said, earlier in chapter 16, he also said that Paul preached the word that the apostles have been preaching. He re-emphasized the doctrine. In this shutting of the old, you would conform to everything that the system allows for you to conform. That is not sin. You will conform. You would conform. You would, you would keep yourself under subjection even when you have a release for something else. You will be submissive to the leadership. And I don't know what leadership is for you. But even though, as long as it's not seen, as long as God does not, it doesn't really affect the kingdom of God. As long as it doesn't affect your tenants as a believer, you can take it. You can, you can just let it pass. He said that Paul re-emphasized the teaching and he said the church grew. And the church grew. You know another thing about the old is that you would have to go the extra mile. He said the church grew. He was preaching. He was preaching the same doctrine that the apostles preached. Even though he had, let's say, another revelation. He was preaching the extra mile principle. And we're going to take that from Matthew 5. The extra mile principle. In Matthew 5, 
it talks about the extra mile. 5 verse 39. It says that, but I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whatsoever shall smite thee on the right cheek. Maybe give us the NLT. It says that if, he, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you should turn the left. It says if someone demands your coat, you should give him your clock. And it says that if someone says go one mile, you will go two miles. And that's what Paul was doing. Paul was waiting for the new. He was waiting for the new instruction. He knew that it was time to move. But he was doing same old things with so much vigor that there was, that there was increase in the body of Christ. You know, the, in, the, in the world or in the marketplace, you know how you know that someone is about to, to resign? They start giving you less quality. They start having divided attention. You know, but that is not scriptural. That's not our principle. In God, we should give the extra mile, especially when it's time to move. Especially, especially. What you are saying to God is that I need to outgrow where I am. And that's it. Many times, um, some years back, God said that, you know, if you desire a promotion, then you need to go the extra mile. And it's not for men, it's for me. Because I'm a just judge. I need to know that you have outgrown this position. I, God, need to be justified. And it happened. So you give the extra mile. And what is that extra mile? So, and where is the new? Maybe for you, the new may be moving from not enough to more than enough in terms of financially. And I know that finances are a tough topic and I really don't like talking about it. But the truth is that if you are not giving an extra mile, there's no way you are going to move from not enough to more than enough. It's the truth. And let the church say amen. I know that we have been so bastardized about giving to God. But I say it's giving to God. I say again it's giving to God. I say again it's giving to God. It's not giving to man. It is giving to God. Extra mile. You have to go the extra mile. I don't know what the old may be. Maybe the old may be for you. It's, 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 a new, it's a new offer. It's a promotion. It's another level. It's a new job. You have to give the extra. You must, out, you must pour out everything. And you must say to the just judge that I've outrun this position. I've outranked this place. I have more capacity. I can do more. Your singular performance appraiser boss is God. You must do that. Let's not be Christians that are looking for the easy way out. No, we must pour the last mile. And what is the last mile in church? He that wants to lead will first be a servant. How are you giving extra? How are you going above and beyond? How are you doing that in God? And if you are here and there is nothing you do for God in his body, there's no easy way to say that it is not right. Pastor Tony said a few Sundays back that you can either live safe or live cold. It's, it's either or. You can't live you have to choose one. Are you still living saved? Or are you living cold? And then if you are living cold, how are you pouring out your all? It is okay to do things when you are okay to do it. But it is even blessed to do it when you don't feel like doing it. Uh, that is the best time to do it. Because you are telling your body and you are telling your flesh that you have no control over me. I am in control. I and the Holy Spirit are in control over me. So when I don't feel like coming to church, I have to come. To, that's the most. That's the most important time I come to church. Other times I don't. I don't. I will, may not come to church for other reasons. But if it's because I don't feel like, if it's because I am tired, if it's because of something, I must do it. Because one one step you give the enemy it takes ten steps. Extra mile. Extra mile. And that's in shutting the old. We, and we move to the second thing. is the resistance of the Lord. In Acts 16, I think verse 7, it talks about how Paul was trying to go into certain cities and other cities. And he said the spirit of the Lord resisted him. Many a times we don't talk about this in church. That not every resistance is from the enemy. Not every delay or closed door is the, is the work of Satan. We give Satan too much credit sometimes. Sometimes the Lord resists us. So he resisted Paul. He says that they, he, they were trying to go to Maisha. He resisted them. said the Spirit of the Lord suffered them not to go. And he brings to mind again Zechariah. And how 
the Lord resisted him from having children. And Hannah, and how the Lord resisted her from having children until she was ready to give birth to Samuel. Even Abraham, how the Lord resisted. Because we can see that eventually when the miracle came, it was not because they did anything different. It was not because they had sinned and they had repented. It was nothing of their making. God just needed, God had identified them. God had made a choice in them. They had a purpose and they needed to wait for the times and the season to align. Zachariah needed to wait for Jesus, for Mary to be ready. For Jesus to be born before they got pregnant with John the Baptist. That needed to happen. So sometimes, and it's for all of us, so that when the enemy comes and attacks your mind, that maybe it is you. Maybe it is because you have not done X and you have not done Y and you have not done Z. No, you need to understand that sometimes it's the Lord. He constrains us. He resists us. He closes doors. Yes, it's not a popular message, but God closes doors. Sometimes because that is the wrong door. That is the wrong assignment. That is not meant for you. So you must understand that when we're talking about the new doors may shut at your face. But that does not mean that God has given up on you. In fact, it means that God has made a choice in you. You can't just do any assignment. You can't just, you can't just have children. They have to be significant in the kingdom of God. You can't just have wealth. There has to be a time for the wealth. There has to be a demand for the wealth. There has to be vessels. We talk about the widow and, and, and the widow and Elisha. And how she had debts to pay. And she had the last oil. And he said, bring vessels. So sometimes God doesn't give you wealth because there are no vessels. Hallelujah. It's resistance. He's resisting you. Because if there are no vessels to pour in, what will happen is that you will digest and go into all sorts of things. And God in his mercy, he's resisting you. So sometimes in the old, and just so that you know, so the enemy does not steal your joy and your peace unnecessarily. You know you are still smacking the will of God, even though things in the physical doesn't look like they are moving. Hallelujah. And we go to the third thing. And the third thing was this vision. Acts 16 verse 9. Can you just put it up? And many a times when we say the new, when we say God is doing a new thing, sometimes we're like, I'm, I'm done. I've heard that before. Nothing happened. 2 Peter 19, 1 19. You will do well to pay attention to the prophetic word. It's you that will do well. <laughs> it is I that will do well. The fact that a word was released, not everybody may pay attention. One way to show that you believe a word is that you pay attention to the word. Is that you go and go back to the word. Is that you stay with the word. Is that you remain there. And good enough in this church, we don't move from topic to topic. Like you come today, we talk about faith, tomorrow love, tomorrow joy. We don't do that's That's the benefit of a prophetic house. You stay there until you can get revelation on how this applies to you. So Paul had seen a vision. And says, come to Macedonia. Where in Macedonia? No, it wasn't given. Details were not, were sparse. There was no detail. To help us, help us how? Is it to heal the sick? Is it to preach the word of God? Details were scarce. And Second Peter 1.19 says that, until a light shines in darkness, say your lamp shines in darkness, until the day dawns, and then the day star arises in your heart. What does this mean in English? It means that when you get the prophetic word, it doesn't have to seem much. The uncertainties will be more than the certainties. So it will be like a lamp. But if you keep that lamp, if you continue to follow that lamp, you will get to the point where the sun will arise on you such that the lamp will bright, it brightens in gradation. What I'm trying to say is that revelation is progressive. So you cannot stay and say, because I don't have all the facts. I don't know all that I need to know. You can imagine just a vision. How many of us have had dreams and we wake up and we just pray and we move on and we forget? Many. How many of us have gotten a thought and maybe we're just praying in church, we got a thought and it looks like a good idea. Then when we leave church, we forget about it. Many. So Paul demonstrated here that you can go blind. Hallelujah. And that's the third thing. You can go blind. You know, in business school, they will say it's the first mover's advantage. Meaning that the risk is going to be so high, the certainties are going to be so low, but the benefit is going to be tremendous. And that's what we do in church. And that's why in church, we cannot be playing catch-up. We can't, and personally, he said that this morning, we can't 
We can't go to where it looks like it is green. Okay, let's just pick um, oil and gas because there's money. Oh, let's just pick renewable energy because it's the new thing. Oh, let's just pick climate change because that's where the money is. No, 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 no. Paul did not pick. He was given. He was told. We don't pick and then ask God to back us up. We don't do that. Every faith move is come, starts with an instruction. Every faith move. I repeat, starts with an instruction. If not, you are going on your own journey and you are trusting God to back you up. And that's not how God works. You are his servant, not the other way around. Hallelujah. We are unprofitable servants, is what one scripture says. So we follow. He doesn't follow us. Hallelujah. As loving as he is, he will wait till we come back like the prodigal son. Every faith move starts with an instruction. But the instruction is not supposed to be very clear. Is what we are saying. So sometimes it may be that some things are coming to you repeatedly. You put on the news, you see it. You come to church, you hear. You may hear from even a brother, not even on the pulpit. You go somewhere else, you see it. Everything is just coming at you. You know that there may be something here, but I really don't know. Then you continue to, to pay attention to it. And sometimes paying attention to it may be just shoving the door and see whether it will open. <laughs> and before you know, the door opens. And you'll be wondering, ah, is it this easy? Yes, it's because you have paid attention to it. So not every time that is going to be clear. Amen. Am I talking to somebody? Because if not, we keep coming to church, keep praying, keep singing, keep dancing, and nothing is significantly happening in our life. But we are living called. Everybody say, I'm living called. There is a purpose that should be higher than my, my livelihood and my sustenance right now as a believer. There should be something. And if you have nothing to do, be like, Paul, go and continue in the things that you have received instruction for up to now. Continue to the greatest dimension. Continue. But you must live beyond your daily sustenance. And you must live with a measure of uncertainty. Because that is faith. It's a faith is the substance of things hoped for. If there is no hope, there is no faith. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's substance. It's substance. It's tangible. That means you are working in it already. You are, you, are, you, are doing, you are taking steps in the direction of faith. You can't say I'm in faith and you are just sitting down. Sometimes even in healing, you have to believe that you are healed even when you don't feel like you are healed. And if the Lord says to you that I have healed you, you must get up from that sick bed and begin to walk. You must get up from that sick bed and begin to do all the things you would have naturally done because that is faith. Everything must not align first. Amen. And the last point for this I will take is about when he went, when he decided to go. He said he went immediately. There is spring obedience in that. He went immediately. But what happened? There were storms and there was oppositions. And this one now was not God resisting him. <laughs> this was storms from the devil. This was storms. And he said they got to Macedonia finally. And then... One day, he healed, a, a, he delivered a possessed girl. And then the officials beat them, stripped them, and put them in prison. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are leaving for an assignment beyond you, you must have challenges. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. He said, indeed... All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You, if you are not being persecuted, we can infer. Should we infer? <laughs> Should we infer that maybe you are not really living a godly life? He said, all that decide that they will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But... What does that mean to you and me? When persecutions come, what is, it, what is our reaction to it? Because we are speaking about the new. It's not going to be something that you just walk in. Like I said, doors will open and you'll be shocked. But when you walk into those doors, it's going to be buzzbows most times. It's going to be storms that you do not anticipate. When they said to Peter, Peter, come. Peter thought that, okay, I just walk on water and I get to meet the master. No. <laughs> Storms are there. Storms are waiting. And it's for the believer. So we must not have this mindset that if I'm a believer, why is this happening to me? No, 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 no. 
That is why it is happening to you. If you decide today that you're not collecting those monies that are that are not actually salaries, they're not actually revenue, they're just in between, it's not really seen, it's an, it, maybe it's an appreciation fee. <laughs> and you decide today that you're not going to collect, what's going to happen? First things first, your, 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 your standard of living will be, will be shocked. You will have some shock in your living standard. Second thing is that people, your colleagues that are doing similar things will chastise, they will criticize you. So that is persecution. Means that there is no godly path that is free of obstacle. So let's go back to Paul. And we saw what, what, what happened. How can God send you on an assignment and then you land in prison? If you, God sends you to do that project with the government and something happens, you didn't bribe somebody, you didn't really water their hand, you didn't play to their terms, you didn't put their person in, on your board, and then they just instigate EFCC, and then you land in prison. What, how, do you want, how do you feel instantly? How do you feel? How do you feel? And we're here to talk about it. So it says that they went to prison, and I believe that they were in prison naked. So it's even double. You are in a crowded place with people you don't know, and you are stripped. It said, but at midnight, they prayed and they sang. And this is where I am. Many times, where we have preached this gospel, it's almost like they prayed and they sang and they prayed for deliverance. But I'm here to tell you that Paul was not praying for deliverance. Because the capacity you build, build in the storm is what you use above the storm. The storm is meant to bring out something in you that you did not know existed. But many times we cry to God, deliver me of the storm. And being a good God, sometimes he delivers us. But guess what? You can't even carry the assignment anymore. Because that storm was to bring out the best in you. And I will show you why I said that Paul and Silas were not praying for deliverance. The first thing is that when the prison door opened and when the chains fell, they didn't run out. That's how you know that the prayer and the singing was not God deliver me. They didn't run out. The second thing is that they took their time to minister to the jailer. They went to his house. The jailer said, come, come and speak to me and my family. They took their time. They went to the jailer's house. They preached to them. They gave their lives to Christ. They baptized them. So they went and looked for river. You know, they didn't have swimming pool in their backyard. So all that night, they were busy. Ministration. They baptized them. And then they went back to jail. <laughs> I'm sure the jailer would have even said, I beg, just go. You are even a good man. You are a child of God. Just go in the morning. I can even just tell them that, ah, I didn't know. This prisoner just even escaped. But Paul said, no, let's go back. And they went back to prison. If it's you, will you go back? Are we in church? This is the best place to tell the truth because God sees your heart. If it's you, will you go back? Say the truth now. The Holy Spirit already knows your answer. There's no need lying. They went back there. He said they went back there till morning. In the morning, the officials came and said, okay, you know what? Let those people go. Let me tell you the third thing why I, I, I knew it was not deliverance prayer they were praying. It's because even when the jailer said, oh yeah, and when the officials said, oh yeah, let them go, they said, we are not going. <laughs> we are not going. That's when Paul brought out his Roman citizen card and said, I'm a Roman citizen. So he knew he was a Roman citizen since when they were beating him, he did not say a word. Guess who, who called him in that vision? This is putting two and two together. It was the jailer. In that vision he saw, it was the jailer. Because that was the only, after then they left Macedonia. That was the reason. That's the person he saw in the vision. If he didn't end up in prison, he wouldn't have fulfilled his vision. Number two. They, talk, they say, come and go. Paul said, we're not going. I'm a so you knew you, could, you had leverage since morning. Since yesterday, you didn't use that leverage. It's not prayer of deliverance. What am I saying? The Bible will say that. That for every trouble, he makes a way of escape. You know how we know we, we use it wrongly. We're thinking the way of escape is to deliver us of the trouble. No, 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 no. The way of escape is to help us to pass through that trouble without the outcome of that trouble affecting us. That's the way of escape. The way of escape for Peter walking on water 
was that he would remove his gaze from the storm. The way of escape will bring his eye back to Jesus and he will be able to walk on that water. Is the way of escape. Where you forget about all that is happening, you refuse to focus on the battles but on the blessing. You will say, for God to have brought me here, he knew that I had everything required to go through this. So I will go through the storm. And I will come out of the storm unflinched like the four Hebrew brothers. They will go through the fire and they will come out unborn. That is the way of escape. That is the way of escape for the believer. The way of escape is not to cut short the battles. No, it's to pull your attention back to God and to give you the grace to walk through it. That all grace will be supplied to you. So I said to myself last night, I said the song that they must have been singing, Paul and Silence in the prison, the song they must have been singing was, You are the reason I live. You're the one for me. You're the one for me. So why should I fear when I have you? I'm surrounded by It may not be easy, but your everlasting love. Why should I care? Why should I care? What people say they don't know what you mean to me. They don't know who you are to me. Why should I fear? When I have you, I'm surrounded. Surrounded by you. I'm by the host of heaven, your everlasting love. Oh, the saints in heaven are wake, are clapping and cheering Why us on. I may I, may I not care what people, what people say? They don't know. Take this and more for you. What you mean? They don't know. They don't know who you are to me. Who you are to me. So because of that, Jesus can say, "I can go to the cross and I can die." He said, even though he was equal to God, he did not think of it as anything. But he took the position of a servant so that he can take the beating. He could take the cross. He could take the piercing. He could take the stripes. He could go to Calvary and he can die for you and I. He said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I don't know who I'm speaking to here today. You may need to start all over again. It could be that you've lost the business. It could be that you lost a spouse. It could be that you've lost a child. It could be that you lost money. It could be you've lost whatever. You know what? There is grace to go through. There is grace to go through. You can take it for God. It means so much to you than the money, than the reputation, than the position, than the company, than anything else. It means more to you. It means more to you. It means so much more to you. It means so much more to you. Paul stayed back. He got a way of escape, as we would like to say, but he went back. He waited. He waited so that God will be glorified. So that they can come back and they can say, release him. And he said, no, no, no. You have to do it publicly. Because you disgraced us publicly. Many of us were not bringing glory to God because we are, be we are being delivered too early. We are being delivered to Ellen. No, you disgraced me publicly. You must glorify my God publicly. Can you wait so that God can take the glory? Can you stay so that God can take the glory? Can you bear the pain so that God can take the glory? Can you bear the shame so that God can take the glory? Can you bear the oppression as we like to call it so that God can take the glory? Are you living for called or are you living saved? Hallelujah. The news is not going to be easy. It's not going to be anything you thought it would be. You may not know that it's in prison that you will meet 
the man that has called you to help them. I, I'm sure that, I'm sure that that was not just a saving for a family alone. I'm sure that that jailer got to do so much more for God. Because God would not have brought Paul through all of this just to save just one family. But I'm sure that the family did so much more of God. So in this new that we are betting, we've spoken about the extra mile principle. And like a pregnant woman, she gathers weights, gathers fluid, gathers fat, just so that when the baby comes, she will have nutrition for two. Oh, like the pregnant woman, doors will close. Oh, her menstrual cycle will get missing. Doors will close. <laughs> new, new alliances will open. Oh, like a pregnant woman, she would see the vision of her baby. She will anticipate it. She will hope, but it's just that she can't see the face yet. She knows a baby is coming. She probably even knows the sex. She probably has seen a 3D picture of the ultrasound of the baby, but she doesn't still know what the baby will look like, but she believes. She moves in uncertainty to the labor ward. But when she goes to the labor, when she goes to the labor ward, the Bible says that as soon as Zion travels, she brings forth. Let's have that scripture. I think it's in Isaiah 66. It says that she brings forth. People of God, she brings forth. People of God, I bring forth. It's not God that brings forth. It's not the Holy Spirit that brings forth. It is you that we bring forth. You know the beautiful thing about God in every of his creation, he puts self-sustainability. So a seed just needs to fall to the ground. It will multiply. It doesn't really need an husband man, an external husband man. Even when you don't plant, you don't plan to plant. You know what? You can just throw a mango seed. And the next thing, you come back and you see a mango tree coming out. You didn't do anything special. Because in, in God, God has put everything that the seed needs to prosper. And he brings the sun and he brings the rain and he made the soil. So he has made provision. Guess what? It's the same thing with labor. The woman really doesn't need anybody to deliver her. Truthfully, all they do is to assist her. What she, she actually gives birth. So this scripture shocked me when I saw it. It says she brings forth. Many of us were waiting for God to bring forth. And God saying you will bring forth. What are you waiting for God to do? You are waiting for help to come from Israel or to come from Egypt or to come from Babylon or to come from relations or to come from friends. No, she brings forth. You would have to bring forth because God has done everything he needs to do. He has put himself inside you. What else? You need nothing. You, you can do it. You can do it. He has made provision of the rain. He has made provision of the sun. He has made provision for the soil. All you need to do is bring forth. Are you here? What can you bring forth? If a woman in labor says she's not going to deliver that baby, guess what? That baby will die. Because everybody can help you, as, as, except now for medicine where there is CS. So we can just induce you and give birth. But the natural birth process, everybody will say, Madam, push this baby. Do you know if this, baby, this woman doesn't want to push, she will not push. Nothing you tell her to do. And don't you know you can be in another circumstance when nobody helps you? When the nurses are busy, they don't really care, they don't, they're not paying attention, they are distracted, the doctor is not coming, and the woman by herself will say, you know what, if I wait here, me and my baby will die, I get up from the bed, squats it, and push out that baby, it has happened. And it happens every day. Why? Because you can bring forth.